Hey there, everyone. Today on the final bar, a choppy, sloppy market continues. The NASDAQ flat for the day, small caps down with the S&P 600 down 3% today. The 10-year Treasury yield back above four and a quarter percent. Which sectors stand to thrive in a rising rate environment? Finally, we'll open up the final bar mailbag. Is this a head and shoulders topping pattern for the Russell 2000? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. Technical and behavioral analysis, as I would sort of group those together, uh, are really focused on how we are wired to think about our investments and what sort of tools and practical uh, you know, capabilities we can apply to minimize the impact of behavioral biases. And I found charts can be a fantastic way of getting outside of your head, of focusing on the evidence that the markets provide back to us. Make sure that we lean into things that are working, that we stick with trends. We don't uh, buy late or sell early, but also recognize when those trends are no longer in place. And I think we're in one of those sort of, as I said, choppy, sloppy environments. We're in one of those periods where there's a question mark around these markets. I think at the end of the day, the larger uh, benchmarks will do a certain thing. Individual stocks and groups can have dramatically different paths. Think about the chart of Alphabet or Meta or one of these that have had a pretty good run, maybe taking a breather, but overall continuing just fine. Act energy stocks breaking to new highs. At the same time, media names breaking down and making new 52-week lows. We have a lot of charts in the middle there. We'll break down as many as we can uh, here on the final bar. Let's get to our right market recap and focus on what happened through the course of the, uh, of the trading day today as we uh, come out of the long holiday weekend. Let's get started here with a poll question. We asked you recently, this is more of a trading 101 kind of question. Placing an order to buy or sell, uh, sell shares at a specific price is known as what? Market order, bracket order, limit order, or fill or kill order. We made a couple of those up. And the correct answer is in fact a limit order. And it's actually, you know, the, the, the specific price or better is technically what you're getting with a limit order. You're basically limiting on a uh, buy limit order how high you will pay for a certain uh, for a certain uh, asset. The reason why we like to ask these sorts of questions is because I find a lot of times technical analysis, particularly charts, can be a really powerful way of identifying those limits, right? If you're looking at a stock like GM, for example, which may be one we look at a little later in the, uh, in the show today, you have a stock that's sort of range bound between resistance and support. Setting buy limits around those support levels can be helpful, especially as we're going down towards support, because what that would mean is I want to be executed as long as we hit that point. So using charts, using support and resistance levels, Fibonacci levels uh, as different ways of anticipating where you may want to place some of those uh, orders can be really, really helpful and really combines the best practices of money management with a good technical analysis discipline. Let's continue on with what happened in the markets today. As I mentioned, kind of a flatter day. Things got redder as we got, uh, got ready for the show today, but let's take uh, stock of where things are at. The S&P 500 closed the day just below 4,500. That was not a level we touched through the day until the very end, we sort of rotated lower. So 4,497, we'll call it. That's down about 0.4% from Friday's close. Of course, yesterday we had the Labor Day holiday uh, here in the U.S., uh, so no, uh, no, no, no equity trading. The Dow down about 0.6%. The Nasdaq Composite actually was in the green for much of the day, just narrowly went into the zero, uh, below zero uh, going into the close, down about 0.1%. So growth stocks, particularly the mega cap growth stocks, look at the Nasdaq 100, still net uh, positive for the day, up 0.1%, hanging in there just fine. And I'm thinking of charts like Alphabet and uh, sort of the magnificent seven stocks, no real horrible charts in there. But there are a lot of stocks that don't look like that, and I think we'll try to hit on some of those here through the, uh, through the show today. The mid-cap S&P 400, this is where it gets interesting, down 2.3% today. The small-cap S&P 600 index down 3% today. So while the NASDAQ sort of holding steady, everything's fine, nothing to see here, small caps getting absolutely crushed on the same day. This is, I think, the story of this environment where breadth conditions, which had bounced in the uh, second half of August, starting to uh, show some, some signs of weakness, it seems, in the short term. And as you see small caps rotate lower, it's really more of a risk-off feel in the smaller, uh, more higher beta, higher risk names. That's not a great risk on sort of offense type of, uh, of reading to get back from the markets. 
Volatility pushing back up, not by much, but enough. We're almost to about 14 on the VIX. And this is after touching down to around uh, 13 uh, here going into, uh, into this week. So overall, you're seeing volatility spike up a little bit. This is after coming down quite a bit in recent weeks. Uh, are we setting up for another retrenchment, sort of that next leg lower as volatility increases? My toolkit would say probably that's more likely outcome, but I am always watching the charts. The charts will tell you when things are getting bad, when things are getting good. So make sure you focus on the, uh, the language of charting as always. Looking at interest rates, interest rates pushing higher. I mentioned in the introduction, 10-year uh, Treasury yields back above 4 and a quarter percent And what I think you need to be thinking of, if you haven't already, we've had a lot of conversations about rising rates and, and elevated rates, or right? what happens if the 10-year yield stays above 4% for a protracted period? What does that mean? Well, certain sectors are designed or tend to do better in that environment than others. One of the sectors doing quite well today, energy at the top of the, uh, of the list. Sector is not usually doing well in a rising rate environment. Technology, which is number two on the list today. But different sectors tend to do well because higher rates tend to have more of a tailwind or a headwind to certain sectors. We'll get on some of those as we get to the sector movements uh, today. But 10-year yields uh, up a bit uh, to 4 and a quarter percent, 427, we'll call it. Long bond yields a little higher at 438 percent. Of course, the short end of the curve uh, still remains fairly elevated. We're about two weeks away from the latest uh, Fed meeting that's in mid-September. Uh, that's when we will hear if there's any change. Most likely not. The uh, futures market sort of pricing in an unchanged uh, Fed funds target rate. Uh, but again, a lot, lot of game left in the next two weeks. We'll see what, uh, see what comes out of it. Bond prices down today. The TLT down about 1.4%. The dollar up by about half a percent. That might be one of those charts to watch. What we've seen recently is the dollar index actually creeping higher over time. And while markets, equity markets can certainly go up as the dollar goes higher, that has happened. Uh, in general, what's happened more recently is the strong dollar has actually hurt uh, risk assets, including equities. Let's look at commodities here very quickly. A mix of uh, results here today with the DBC, which is a broad commodity ETF, up about half a percent. Gold and silver prices both lower. The SLV, a silver ETF, down about 2.6%. I was writing a note for my uh, market misbehavior premium members earlier today. Gold stocks really not feeling it. The GDX continuing to uh, to rotate lower. And again, I'm 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 happy waiting as a chart goes lower, lower lows and lower highs. I think it's 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 great to be patient and wait for some sign of improvement. I would argue we're not quite seeing that yet with gold or gold stocks coming off of all-time highs or testing all-time highs for gold, but you know showing some short-term weakness here in uh, in recent weeks. Crude oil prices pushing higher. The USO was up 1.1%. Finally, cryptocurrencies, a bit of a mixed bag as well. Ether prices essentially flat from where we were yesterday. Bitcoin uh, down about a half a percent. Now, this is coming over the long holiday weekend where cryptocurrencies, of course, trade uh, 24 7. So, did trade a little lighter volume certainly over the, uh, the weekend. But Bitcoin currently around 25,680, we'll call it. Ether prices around 1630. You know, looking at sectors, it's interesting, and this is what a good reminder that you know, when we talk about things like higher rates or lower rates and what sectors tend to do better or worse, you have to remember those are all generalities, right? Um, you know, uh, rates going higher doesn't tend to be good news for growth stocks because the growth, the future earnings growth, which is what you're betting on, you're betting on these companies will continue to grow over time. That's the essence of growth investing. Strong companies doing well will continue to grow, and that creates the forward-looking uh, optimism that uh, generates uh, you know, higher prices today. Uh, higher rates make that less attractive because the higher rates basically mean the future valuations are lower. And so as a result, it's less attractive. Uh, and so higher rates don't tend to be good for growth stocks, but they can certainly do well. You have to remember, I think of it as more of headwinds and tailwinds. Higher rates are headwinds for growth stocks like technology tend to be tailwinds for things like industrials and financials, which tend to do better. And look at a chart of the 10-year yield dollar sign TNX versus one or two of those sectors, and you'll see what I mean over time. Today, the energy sector at the top of the list, up half a percent. Uh, technology number two, up 0.4 percent. Everything else was flat or down. XLY and XLC are other uh, FANG sectors, basically flat for the day from Friday's close. A couple sectors really dropped today. Uh, materials down 1.8 percent. Industrials down 1.7. Utilities uh, down 1.6. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500. Let's look at today and how that fits into uh, the big picture. So here's today. Let's zoom in just a little bit here at the last 
we'll call it the last three months, just to look at what happened here uh, recently. So you can see the bounce higher off of the low in mid-August. This was the uh, swing high in uh, late July. We then rotated lower, broke the 50-day moving average, broke a couple trend lines, which we highlighted on the uh, on the show. And now for now, I've, uh, have set a, uh, a higher low. On a closing basis, we ended that Pull back around 43.70 on an intraday basis, got a little bit lower, uh, just below 43.40. Then we rotated back higher. Now, Friday into uh, Tuesday's session, we're closing at the lows of the day today, right around 4,500. So, you know, what's interesting is, I, you know, if I would draw, what does a correction look like at the July peak? If you said, Dave, what would a pullback look like? Let's say sep uh, August, September are a little weaker. What would it kind of look like? I would kind of draw this down leg and an up leg and then one more down leg. I would probably draw an ABC correction, what you call it, uh, which is an initial down move, a counter trend move back higher, and then one more move lower. So we've actually followed that basic textbook pullback phase pretty well. Now, the S&P has gotten back above its 50-day moving average. So, you know, in my opinion, from a tactical perspective, Holding the 50-day would be pretty important. We break below the 50-day. I think that immediately says we retest the lows. If not further, I'd be looking at 4,200. So I think a lot riding on whether we hold the 50-day moving average here. Still a little bit away from current levels. We finished today around 4,500. That's currently around 4,470. But 30 points is not too far. That's a little bit more than we dropped uh, today, and we're right there. So, you know, I think holding that, and, and again, that's a basic sort of barometer. We're above the 50-day. Things aren't that bad. We get below there. It's not the end of the world necessarily, but it does mean you'd want to retest uh, some downside objectives. And I think that's an important level to, uh, to watch. Now, let's go back to the uh, bigger picture. Zoom out a little bit. Uh, when in doubt, zoom out, of course. So what's interesting is if you take this drop and take the rally that we've had and have a similar kind of pullback to the one we had. So sort of this is wave A and then a wave B is higher and we have another wave C. That gets us down right around 4200, 4250 or so. It depends on, you know, how you draw it exactly, but gets us down into that level and that's this confluence of support that we've talked about. The 200-day moving average for the S&P currently around 4163, a trend line using the major lows over the last 8 or 9 months, currently around 4220, we'll call it. Uh, Fibonacci support around 4180. So you got a number of things sort of suggesting that's a decent downside objective. And I wouldn't be surprised if September, which actually tends to be a pretty rough month for stocks, it gets down to around those levels. But what that would mean, in my opinion, is that sets us up for a really nice recovery in the uh, in the fourth quarter. That's the base case that's in my head. But as always, we'll, uh, we'll look at the charts. I would also pay attention to the momentum. The RSI has not gotten above uh, 60 for this uh, for this sort of uh, mini stretch here. I'd be watching to see if that can happen. If so, that would tell me to be not so bearish and think about maybe upside uh, movements from here. Now, volatility, very much part of the story. A couple of my conversations with guests recently have, uh, have touched on the, uh, on the VIX. VIX back down at the lows for the year. We touched 13. I think that was on uh, Friday session of last week. We bounced up a bit to 14 today. But in this green shaded area, sort of where we've been for the last week, this is where we spent most of the time in June and July of, uh, of this year. And that's sort of that low volatility bullish phase. I mean, uh, it, that sort of environment is, is certainly a possibility. I think the way that you tell that we're not in a bullish phase anymore is volatility spikes, right? And the reason is because if the market's gonna kind of steadily climb the wall of worry higher, volatility actually usually remains fairly low in that scenario uh, because you know it's sort of drifting higher, there's no real panic, it's just sort of you know reinforcing the confidence that things are still okay on the long term, and that would be the market rallying on low volatility. Volatility spikes, not in a bullish environment usually, in unusual circumstances that can happen, but you see the VIX spike higher and that usually means we're dropping pretty quickly. So I would be watching this uh, chart because we're at the lower end of volatility. You see volatility spike above uh, you know, 1415. That tells us that uh, we may be in that next leg lower. That, that might be an important chart to watch uh, here going forward as well. I do want to look at 10-year ten uh, yield. And as I mentioned, certain sectors tend to do better. It's more the value-oriented sector. So here we're looking at the dollar sign TNX, which is the 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, on Friday's mailbag, if I remember right, we had a question on how this is quoted. This is 10 times the yield on the 10-year uh, Treasury bond. So 42.68 actually means 4.268%. Uh, just so you know, just meant, and most of us, I think, just mentally move the decimal point. You kind of get used to it. Uh, so around 427 on the 10-year uh, yield. You can see the pop higher on Friday, continuing higher today. So the trend in rates over the last six months, really, 
has been positive, right? We found support around three and a quarter. Now we're all of a sudden a full percentage higher around four and a quarter. Now a lot of things are derived from 10-year ten uh, yields, things like mortgage rates and loans and stuff, all kind of can be derived back to this uh, key benchmark rate. It's just an important benchmark that a lot of other things are sort of, uh, of derived from. So what's the impact of rising rates? What's the impact of rates staying elevated? So it, you know, certainly to the consumer, that can, uh, that can be a problem. And certainly I would say there's a lag, right? Higher rates tend to have a ripple effect for months, if not years down the road, because this is when you're trying to buy a house or a car, things that are not often that you do those purchases, but can be significant expenses when you do. Now, what's interesting about this chart right now is that rates have been trending higher, but what has not been trending higher is the relative performance of value versus growth. This is actually making a new low today for the last uh, for the last 12 months. So sort of an interesting uh, juxtaposition. Rising rates would usually tell me value stocks are going to do better than they are. And I would say a lot of this is because of the dominance of the mega cap growth trade. Still charts like Alphabet holding up just fine uh, in the face of, uh, of rising rates. So this ratio has gone down. In general, I would expect rising rates to mean value stocks are outperforming. I would say the disconnect here most likely means that this ratio is going to turn higher. And maybe this is an opportunity to get into value stocks that are being beaten down on a relative basis and bet on that mean reversion. Possibly. Again, I would, I would look for the chart. For now, the ratio uh, seeming to, uh, to go lower. Let's look at some individual areas of the market. I was going to bring up the XLE, the energy sector, as I mentioned, the top performing uh, sector today. If you look at it on an unadjusted basis, so put the little underscore in front of the ticker, that takes away the dividend adjustment. Now we're looking at the pure price action and on a higher yielding uh, ETF like the XLE, I think it's helpful to, uh, to do, that, do that. The XLE yield, currently yields around 3.5%, that's the dividend yield. If you look, this is the uptrend that we've been talking about. We're still below the all-time highs, which are here around $93 to $95, uh, going back to June of last year, also November of last year, and January of this year, all sort of just above current levels. So the impressive run in, in energy, I think, is noteworthy. The challenge is, is there enough gas in the tank left to push above resistance? And that's what I'm not so sure about. I would assume yes, because I like trends that are working, and I'm going to assume that it's going to continue until the chart tells me otherwise. But we have a confluence of resistance. We have a pretty significant resistance zone above current levels. And so a pullback from that range, pretty much a reasonable expectation. Does that make a higher low? And then we're able to actually break through. That's what I'd be looking for on this chart in particular. And one of the things that gives me confidence in that is because other uh, you know, particular stocks within the energy sector are actually doing quite well. Oxy making a new swing high today. We talked about it testing resistance, sort of a cup and handle type of pattern, just breaking above there today, up about 2.5% today. Other names in the sector, uh, like a Halliburton, which is in equipment and services, you know, again, making a new swing higher, testing one today, coming off of a higher low above the 50-day moving average. The momentum is strong. These charts are actually setting up pretty well. By the way, if you missed, uh, uh, I think it was Monday, yesterday, uh, we did a special event, Grayson Rose and I, from here in the studio, uh, we did top 10 charts uh, to watch in September 2023. One of the 10 was an energy stock. Grayson actually uh, put that one in there. We talked a little bit about energy and the attractive setups that we're seeing in that space. So if you missed that, make sure you go to our YouTube channel and uh, certainly watch it as well. Um, finally, I'll just highlight one of the groups breaking down or you know, following semiconductors holding up quite well, following a group like home construction or home builders uh, actually struggling. Home Depot actually testing resistance for now, not able to get above there. But if I take a step back from my monitor looking at a chart like Lennar, it's hard not to see this as a rotation or what I call a change of character from an uptrend phase to a downtrend phase. Now, it's still above the 200-day, but number of tests of the 50-day moving average on the way up in February, March, April, again in June, and then we break higher. We test it in August, but then we finally break it. We're now putting in lower highs in early August, lower highs coming into the, uh, into the uh, Labor Day weekend, now down another 5% today. The RSI is remaining below 50. The relative strength had been strong consistently, now rotating lower. So charts like this that had been so strong, this is sort of the probably time to take profits, probably time to find some other opportunities maybe to rotate into. That's the impression that I get when I take a step back from my screen and uh, look at the chart of uh, home builders like Lennar and DR Horton and others. Uh, so make, make sure you take a second look there. If you are holding those names, I think a really good opportunity to revisit and see if you still feel comfortable holding on to those names here. 
We're going to continue on opening the final bar mailbag. Before we do so, a couple quick announcements. First off, we've gotten a lot of really good questions here recently from all of you. Thank you so much for that. Keep them coming, won't you? You can email us your questions at the final bar at stockcharts.com. Anything fair game on technical analysis on the stock charts platform, on particular tickers and ideas and levels. We're open to all of it and we'll highlight some of the questions that we think are really good to uh, consider as a group, if you will. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email. On X, just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV. And of course, on our YouTube channel, just drop a comment below the video you're watching. We'll hope to answer your question in our next mailbag show, which will be on Friday of this week. Also, to let you know, we have a live Q&A every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We had a lot of fun last week. I forget where we focus, but it, there usually ends up being sort of a commodities agriculture focus or a breadth and sentiment focus. Sort of depends on where the Q&A goes, and that's kind of how we like it. We'll keep it open-ended and see what sort of questions come up. Tune in tomorrow on Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Go to our YouTube channel. You can actually set a notification so you don't miss it. You can tune in when we go live at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern tomorrow and bring your questions, won't you? Let's continue on with the final bar mailbag again. Thanks so much for all of your, uh, all of your feedback on our show and the questions as well. And let's get to question number one. Dave, if investors cannot actually invest in indices like the S&P or the Nasdaq Composite, where do the volume figures come from? Really good question, and I don't show volume often uh, on, uh, on, my, uh, on my charts, but I do have this one that I like to do because it has volume and also has on balance volume. And on balance volume is a Joe Granville designed indicator. It's a very simple way of looking at volume trends over time and just saying is volume on an up day or a down day. And you use that to smooth up the volume over time. So here's the S&P 500 uh, in the top with moving averages. And then here's the daily volume reading on the S&P 500. So the question is, where do you get the volume from? So if you're thinking about volume on a broader index like the S&P or the NASDAQ, you really have two choices here in 2023. Now, decades ago, you didn't have two choices. You could just look at the S&P and what you would do is you would calculate the volume because you know the 500 stocks, you know how much volume was on each of those 500 names. You literally add them all up and there's your volume for the S&P. Now in 2023, though, most things and, and, and certainly the more uh, highly followed indexes have pretty liquid ETFs. So if I'm looking at volume for the S&P, I don't really look at the volume on the S&P 500 anymore, to be honest. I do SPY. And if I'm looking at the NASDAQ, I do the QQQ, both of which are heavily traded. Both of them have tons of liquidity, which means there's a lot of shares tra trading hands. So the volume and particularly the changes in volume can be a pretty good read on things. So if I'm looking at a chart like this, the dollar value of how many vol of how many uh, shares were traded, I think, or, or, or the number of shares that were traded for an index, I don't think super relevant. Looking at the SPY and recognizing the daily, uh, you know, shares that trade hands and how that changes over time, I think very relevant. So if you are going to look at volume, I probably look at the SPY or the QQQ these days. Uh, you couldn't do that before, and that's why you would look at uh, the volume reading. So you know, what, look at the volume picture on the S and P 500. One of the question marks I would say for this market here is if you look at the rally that we saw last week, and this really started the week prior. But you think about last week going into the holiday weekend, ignore today, look at how the volume trend has been going down. So when the market rallies on lower volume, suspect, right? So anytime there's a move in price and the volume is trending downwards, that's when you want to start thinking the opposite. Because what that means is, you know, the, the general thinking is there's less institutional weight. Big institutions trading millions and hundreds of millions of shares at a time are the ones that can really move the needle on the major benchmark. So a market trending, particularly a new move on lower volume, usually a little more suspect. That's a question I would have for, uh, for the uh, most recent volume. On the QQQ, you can see the same thing. Trend higher in price over the last week or two, trend lower in volume. And so that divergence really suggests that maybe this bounce is a counter trend move. And if you would see the market start to rotate lower and see volume increase, look out below. That's sort of the danger sign. That's the uh, bear thesis playing out pretty well. And so that's why I think it's helpful to look at the volume leading up to today and then think about what you might see going forward over the next week or two and what that might tell you about the uh, market condition. So directly to answer your question, you aggregate it, right? In a, in a platform like Stock Charts, we have all the data on individual stocks. We can look at volume on any different indexes. In reality, very few people tend to look at that outside of the major indexes. I would use ETFs. Just watch the less liquid ETFs because the volume reading can be a little less meaningful because they're just less shares trading hands. Let's go to the next question here. 
Is that a head and shoulders top for IWM, the Russell 2000, and a head and shoulders bottom for TWM? Now, TWM may be an ETF you're not familiar with. I don't bring this up very often on the show. That's the ultra short Russell 2000 ETF. So most major indexes these days have, uh, you know, sort of traditional long, uh, you know, exposure, just the, the regular one. So IWM is the Russell 2000 ETF. You have leveraged long uh, ETFs. You have inverse ETFs and then leveraged inverse ETF. So making a leveraged bet, meaning if something moves 1%, I want a 2% gain on that particular uh, day. Uh, and you can do that long or short. And, and a lot of the liquid ETFs and even commodities now uh, have those sorts of things. As always, I would, I would uh, use a great dose of caution. They can be helpful vehicles to express a particular investment thesis, but I would encourage you to use them on short-term timeframes, if at all. They are not meant to be held over longer-term timeframes. When I see people holding leverage ETFs for months and months, you are really not using them as designed and, and unknown. I mean, it's sort of crazy things can happen uh, because of deterioration and, uh, and, uh, and, and different, different impacts based on how those things are actually uh, created using derivatives. Get back to your question here. Is this an inverted head and shoulders or what you call a head and shoulders bottom? It's called a boot up bottom uh, for the record. Uh, is, uh, is this one? So yes and no. And, and, and I would say the, 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 the actual answer, because you mentioned in your question, I had a couple questions on this. The, the one question you said you were studying for your CMT exams. Congrats on that and good luck. Uh, they are they are a bear, but so well worth it. I'm so thankful that I did that. I, I, I would encourage all of you to uh, consider those, particularly if you want to be in the uh, in the investment industry using technical analysis. It's a, it's an important uh, milestone to reach. But the uh, textbooks will tell you, and they are right. You can't call this an inverted head and shoulders bottom until you break the neckline. And we uh, have talked on the show a lot of times about three steps to any price pattern. I actually did a webcast on this. Uh, maybe last year or the year before, uh, three steps to any pattern. And the steps that I would think of them uh, are as such. S step one is the setup. We appear to be setting up a pattern. I think this is in the setup phase. It's not completed yet. It's setting up. And the reason why you can say it's setting up is because you have a low, uh, you have a, a higher low and another higher low. And today's bounce, I think, sort of cements that higher low and that potential right shoulder. Then you have the confirmation, sorry, then you have the trigger, which is you actually make the signal, right? The pattern is completed when you break the neckline. So on an inverted head and shoulders, it's not a valid pattern until you break above this neckline. So until the uh, TWM gets above 15, we'll call it, it's not a vad valid head and shoulders bottoming pattern. That trigger is telling you that it is actually that pattern. Because let's say it drops tomorrow, it will no longer look like a head and shoulders pattern. So by waiting for that break of the neckline, you're waiting for the actual trigger. The third step is a confirmation, right? Validation, right? What happens after the breakout? Do you continue to see buying that would show you that the TWM is in fact breaking out? So this is a potential head and shoulders uh, bottoming pattern. I would say on the IWM, that's sort of your previous chart flipped upside down. Is this a potential head and shoulders top? Absolutely, which is a high surrounded by two lower highs. Here's your left shoulder, here's your right shoulder. It's actually pretty well formed so far, but you need to wait for a break of the neckline. What's interesting about the IWM chart, by the way, is this neckline connecting the low in June and the swing low here in August is almost right on top of the 200 day moving average, all around 182 uh, for the IWM. So, I would be, if I were you, I would be using the stock charts platform, set an alert, a price alert for when the IWM or if and when the IWM breaks below 182. What that would suggest is we have completed that pattern, we have hit the trigger, and then I would bring up that chart and see if we get that follow through. If I'm bearish here or if I'm not, I mean, I would be looking for a break of that neckline as a validation that this uh, sort of rally we saw in the second half of August probably dissipated and we're, we're preparing for the next leg lower. Given the fact that small caps have been in a what, much re, uh, weaker position, reasonable to expect the IWM to break down before the S&P or even the NASDAQ. And so I think this might be an important chart to uh, watch and certainly an alert that I will be setting. I would encourage you to do the same. Next question. Has the COPPA curve turned up for the NASDAQ, also the XLK and the SPY? Now, here's the COPPA curve chart that I actually have uh, in my, um, what do I call it? The Mindful Investor Live chart list. And you can, uh, you can find that on my uh, blog. If you go to the articles tab on stock charts, go to my blog called The Mindful Investor. Um, you can uh, access my live chart list at the, uh, the top. And one of the charts toward the end of that chart list has the COPPA curve. Now, the COPPA curve, was, uh, was popularized by a uh, strategist, Sedge Kopic, 
couple years ago, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm understating, it was a couple decades ago, and uh, Kopic basically uh, made this uh, observation that when the market goes lower, it tends to go into this mourning period, similar to when you mourn the death of a loved one. And after 11 to 14 months uh, during a larger cycle, you tend to see uh, things improve again. And so applying that methodology to the New York Composite Index, which is what Kopic originally did it on, that's dollar sign NYA. We have an indicator called Copic. Use these parameters, and it will match sort of his, uh, you know, initial uh, initial work. And what's happened is the Copic curve really at the beginning of 2023 started to slope higher. If you run this analysis, you you certainly can run it. Uh, you know, Copic ran it on the New York uh, Composite Index. He was looking at the broader uh, index. Could you run it on the XLK? I, I don't see why not. I don't. I don't. I don't call a foul on that one. Could you run it on the S&P? I guess. Um, I, I don't think you'll get dramatically different results, to be honest with you. So I don't know if running that on monthly charts of all of those is going to give you a dramatic difference. I would pick one and stick with that. So I use the, the New York Composite uh, based on, on Copic's work. But pretty much all of them in January or February uh, gave a buy signal. And the buy signal is basically when the uh, curve is going down. So month to month change is negative. And all of a sudden that changes and month to month change is positive. So the Copic curves all gave a buy signal at the beginning of this year. Now, what does that mean? What Copic's analysis would tell us is that that means that the pullback phase that we saw in 2022 is now over and that the larger trend is now more positive. Now, what you have to remember is when you're zooming out this much and when you're using a monthly chart, there's a lot of movement that can happen. There's a lot of drawdowns that can be uh, at play uh, and so this buy signal from the Copic curve could prove out to be a brilliant entry point 10 years from now. But between now and then, there could be some career busting moves up and down. So this is one of those charts that I bucket with like the Hindenburg Omen and some of the uh, you know weekly and monthly charts uh, to really think about the overall larger phase. But at the end of the day, they're not really great for timing day to day, week to week. That's where I would use weekly and, and certainly daily charts to make that assessment. Um, to answer your question, yes, the Copic curve turned bullish at the beginning of the first quarter, really at the beginning of the year for now remaining positive. That is suggesting the bigger picture trend in the uh, major equity averages uh, still positive. But again, I would say there could be quite a drawdown that you may not want to be a part of, and that Copic curve could still be proven accurate. Next question, uh, what is the risk of pyramiding up to 100% of your fund into an index fund if it has been your best performer? And you mentioned a number of different things about William O'Neill mentioned his, in his book about not putting more than 50% of your portfolio in a particular asset. But if something's really starting to work, uh, you know, would you put 100% of your capital here? This is an interesting one. And what's funny is the financial industry, I think, has built a business around convincing you that is a bad idea because they tell you about diversifying. And they tell you if you focus too much on one thing, then you're, you're opening yourself up to a lot of risk because what if that one thing doesn't work anymore? I think what you have to remember, uh, and a lot of investors like um, – uh, you know, Warren Buffett and others have famously said, you know, go in an index fund and go, 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 go somewhere else and not think about it anymore. If you're going to do nothing else with your capital, it's fine to be fully invested in a diverse group. And that's what you have to remember. It's something like an index fund, assuming it's a broad index, you're getting a lot of diversification already by the fact that you actually have a number of different companies that are, uh, that are represented there. There are a number of books that I would point you to if this is a question you're asking. One is by Gary Antonacci. Uh, and that's called, ooh, Dual Momentum Investing. Another one is by Brian Livingston called Muscular Portfolios. There are others as well uh, that sort of, uh, you know, are not afraid to have a very narrow exposure. And what that means is to hold a small number of ETFs. But both of those books that I just mentioned have a momentum-based approach. So you're not just holding one thing and whether or not it's good, you're rotating it as something that's really good. And I think that got to your question. Let's say something's doing really well. Should I be confident putting 100% of my portfolio there? Um, I wouldn't be afraid to do that if the chart works. Um, what you have to remember is think about how you're managing your risk. Diversification is one of those ways you can manage your risk. How else can you do that? How can you use charts and technical indicators as a stop loss? How can you use volatility or some other indicator to make sure that you lock in gains if and when that stops working? Um, you know, if it starts to no longer perform well, where are you going to rotate those assets to? So as long as you're able to answer those questions effectively, I, uh, in my own personal investing, I actually have a very concentrated portfolio. A lot of times I'll hold two or three ETFs at most, and I'll, I'll put them all into those buckets if the charts compel me to do so. And that is, I think, the most important question you want to ask yourself. 
Final question. Dave, is it ever useful to apply an oscillator to another oscillator? And you actually asked a pretty detailed question. You had this, uh, you implied this chart. You didn't have a chart, so I sort of created this one. You're saying you're looking at the NASDAQ 100 percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average, which is dollar sign NDXA50R. And then you said, can I use something like MACD or stochastics or RSI on that breadth indicator? I don't see why not, in particular something like this, which is bound, right? I mean, an indicator like this can only go to 0% at the low end and 100% at the upper end. I mean, it's, it's, it's bound by the, the math of, of what you're looking at. This is how many stocks out of the 100 are bullish or bearish. And so you're sort of bound by that, uh, by that framework. So using an oscillator to recognize when the uh, breadth indicator has been going down and has turned higher. I don't have a problem with that at all. And if you look back at when you've gotten these buy signals from the MACD, it's actually done quite well. It's told you when the trend was down and then started to turn higher. And those were some of the bounce periods uh, in the major ash. It certainly told you that the breadth conditions were, were turning higher. Uh, so certainly I would have no problem with, uh, with using uh, oscillators like this. And to be honest with you, I've worked with uh, institutional investors, particularly those uh, focused on tactical asset allocation. That's where you're rotating between stocks and bonds and commodities and real estate and hard assets and soft assets. And using oscillators like this on a series of ratios can actually be very helpful. I've worked with uh, institutions doing pairs trading, doing short-term swing trading, using oscillators to determine when two assets become out of sync with one another and betting on mean reversion. So I would certainly say there's statistical benefit to using oscillators like this and trending indicators like MACD to identify shifts in those, uh, in those oscillators. I wouldn't be afraid to uh, do so. By the way, if your chart looks kind of weird like this, when you bring up something like uh, the uh, the breadth indicators, which you have to remember is you don't need log scale if the uh, thing you're looking at is already quoted in percentage terms. So to be honest with you, if you're looking at uh, uh, interest rates, if you're looking at a percent of stocks with a certain characteristic, I would take the log scaling off. The chart's gonna look a lot more normal because that's really a better representation of the data. We use log scaling for actual stock and ETF prices, but for an indicator like this, uh, you can take the log scale off and you're, uh, you're just fine. That is it, folks, for the show. We've got to wrap it up and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. You know, I mentioned the market conditions, sloppy, choppy, some of the adjectives that I would use, frustrating to describe the current market environment. You know, we had an initial sell-off in early August. We recovered a little bit, but overall, it's still sort of in a uh, position of weakness. And I'm concerned about the potential of another leg down. That's sort of the base case that I've been operating off of. This chart of the percent of stocks above their 200-day and the percent of stocks above their 50-day, an important one to watch, particularly on a week like this where we don't have a lot of economic data, not a lot of earnings. I think the markets are sort of left on their own to sort of move freely based on sentiment and investor psychology. This chart might be a good one to see if conditions are indeed getting worse. I'm noticing the fact that the percent above their 50-day has not gotten back above 50%, which is sort of my base case or basic uh, you know, tell of bullish or bearish configuration. The percent of stocks above their 200-day is getting net back down to 50%. We held that in mid-August. Will we hold that in September? I'm skeptical, and I would assume that maybe we're not going to, but I'm going to be watching this chart to see if and when that triggers a uh, bearish confer, uh, confirmation. Chart number two, two ratios making a new 52-week low today. The first one is the equal-weighted S&P versus the cap-weighted S&P. This is a different way of measuring breadth. So when I'm looking at the stocks above their moving averages, I'm also thinking about charts like this. This is basically telling you what are the smaller companies in the S&P doing versus the largest companies in the S&P, and they're going down in a big way. What this tells me is that the mega cap, the magnificent seven, the fang stocks are holding up just fine, which they are, but a lot of other names are starting to really struggle, and this relative performance going down is very much a risk off feel and certainly saying there's that concentration again in the mega cap names. The bottom ratio is value over growth, also making a new 52 week low today. So we've seen value stocks underperforming. We're seeing the equal weighted S&P going down, which once again tells me we're back to the magnificent seven or the fang dominance. And while the market can go up, it tells me to be thinking a little bit more risk off, particularly in stocks outside of those leading growth charts. Finally, General Motors, you know, I was taking a look, I was thinking about phases. I was talking with Grayson Rose on our special yesterday about the uh, Stan Weinstein stage analysis. And I've been doing a lot of thinking recently about just how we ca characterize some of these different phases. For me, I think of the market 
in three directions, up, down, or sideways. The downtrends are called distribution phases. That's what General Motors was doing in the first half of last year. From then till today, I would say we're in a sideways or a consolidation phase. Look at how well we have matched the lower boundary between about $30 to $32 a share, the upper boundary between, we'll call it $41 and $43 a share. Pretty easy trade betting on mean reversion between these two. We are bouncing off the lower level. Now, this sort of range will hold until it doesn't, which is why I think using these for options plays, for just betting on mean reversion uh, can be very, very helpful. Recognizing when we exit that range, when GM can finally break out to the upside or break down to the downside, that's what tells me we're into a different phase and to sort of look for that evolution of the price into that next trending environment. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. As a reminder, don't forget our live Q&A tomorrow on Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern here on our YouTube channel. For Stock Charts of Reb in Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.